Hello, glad to see you again. This being the last show of the series, we've decided to devote it to a question and answer period. We've had so many cards and letters from everyone who's watching us, and today we're going to try to answer some of those questions right here on TV. Also today, it's a great, great privilege to me to be able to introduce the pride and joy in my life. This is my son, Steve, and I've asked Steve to come give me a hand today, and he'll read questions for us. Steve, glad to have you with us. Good Thanks, to see Dad. you today. Okay. I think everybody has probably asked just about the same basic questions, and we've picked a few letters here today that will answer most of the basic questions. If we don't answer your specific question, we will be dropping you a line personally if it's something that only a few people ask. So, Steve, why don't you give us the first question? Okay. The first question is, what is Magic White? What is Magic White? Magic White is a very thin, white, oil-based paint. And it's very important that you know that it's an oil-based paint. Please do not get it confused with gesso. Gesso is a water-based paint. It will not work. Magic White is designed to stay wet on the canvas for extended periods of time. And maybe we'll just uh, demonstrate here a little bit how thin it really is. And let's see. If I can take just a little bit here, and we'll just put it right up here on the canvas. And it's very, very thin. It's almost like water like so. And I hope that does give you an idea of what Magic White is. The big thing is, do not confuse it with gesso. There is a terrific difference between the two. What's our next one, Steve? How do I tell if I have too much Magic White on my canvas? It's a common mistake made. It's very, very easy to put too much Magic White. And probably, well, let's just do it. Let me get an almighty brush here. And let's put some Magic White on the canvas, and we'll just sort of demonstrate. And you, you'll put the Magic White on and really work it back and forth. It takes a very thin coat of Magic White, just enough to get the canvas wet. Okay. Just like so. If there's any doubt in your mind, and you think you may have too much Magic White, I suggest you clean your brush, dry it very well, Go back over the canvas and remove any excess Magic White that's on your canvas. Okay, so you just rub this in very, very good here and work it back and forth. There we go. Nice, even distribution of paint. Once again, if there's any doubt in your mind, clean your brush and go back over it. It will pick up the excess. Okay, what do we have next? Can I use any kind of oil paint for this method? The biggest thing that we're looking for is a paint that is very, very firm. It has to be as thick as you can possibly get it. What we suggest is you go down, open the tube of paint, squeeze it. It should stand approximately three quarters of an inch above the tube by itself. If, when you open it and squeeze it, if the paint's sort of oily, if it runs out the sides, it will not work. We suggest that you really try this. It has to be firm. Okay? What's the next one? The brushes I purchased not seem to work. What do you suggest? We run into this quite frequently. People will watch what we're doing here on TV, and they go down to the local hardware store, and they purchase the cheapest brush they can find. Most of the time, you'll end up with a nylon brush. The brushes that we use, let me just pick one up here. The brushes that we use are natural bristle. These are split bore bristle brushes. So when you purchase a brush, get one that is natural bristle. Do not let them sell you a nylon brush. It will not work. It cuts paint. OK, what's our next question? Can I clean my brushes in turpentine? Turpentine. Several things are wrong. Number one, it has a terrible odor that will drive you out of the house. You'll be painting all by yourself very soon. Probably the biggest thing that happens with turpentine, it leaves a residue in your brushes that can only be cleaned out with soap and water. And if you use soap and water on natural bristle brushes, you're going to find they get very fuzzy and begin to lose their shape. We suggest that you clean only with odorless paint thinner and do not use turpentine. OK, what do we have next? Is it all right to use canvas boards to paint on? 
This is a question that's asked over and over because canvas <coughs> boards are much more reasonably priced than stretch canvas. The big problem with using canvas boards is that inside the canvas board is a thin layer of cardboard. The cardboard has a tendency to absorb your magic white and your canvas will become dry before the picture is finished. We really recommend that you use a canvas that's covered with an acrylic primer double primed, two coats of acrylic. And we find that the stretch canvas is much, much better than the canvas board. Also, the knife has a slight curve in the long edge. It is not straight. The curve is designed in there, so when you push the canvas, it forms to the knife. So we really recommend that you use stretch canvas. What do we have next? The snow on the mountains is so beautiful, but I'm having a hard time making the paint break. Can you tell me what I'm doing wrong? Well, maybe we'll just demonstrate. And I think I can probably answer most of the problems you're having just by doing it. So let's just mix up a little, oh, a little blue-brown and a little touch of alizarin and white. And let's, let's just build an almighty mountain. I think, first of all, let's, so we have a little back ground here to play with. Let's just put in a very quick little simple sky and some blue, just so we have something for the mountain to, to uh, set here against, rather than just a white canvas. We'll just throw in a little blue paint. Okay. Just enough to give us a nice little sky here. Several things are probably happening. And we'll try to cover each one individually here. So let's make a basic mountain shape. And let's just say this is our mountain here. Probably the first thing that's happening is that you're leaving too much paint on the canvas. We want to remove all the excess paint that we possibly can. And we're pushing very, very hard. It's a matter of pushing the paint right into the fabric. So when you're doing this, get tough with it, get strong. This is a time to take out all your frustrations. It's much better than kicking the dog around the house or taking it out on your spouse. This is the way you take out your frustrations. Now I've scraped all the paint off here that I can get. Now I'm going to take the big brush and pull this down. This will take even more paint off and thin what's here. So there's virtually nothing left on the canvas except just the color that's pushed into the material. Okay. So here we have a basic mountain shape. If you're having problems with the snow breaking, the most common problem is that you're pushing too hard. This is absolutely the most delicate touch imaginable. I remember when I was teaching Steve to paint, I used to tell him to pretend he was a whisper floating across the mountain. It's that light of a touch. So you touch it, just let it grab, and just the weight of the knife. And you can make this snow just break and flow right down the mountain. But you need to do this with Oh, pretend your hand, if you're not careful, is going to float right away. It's that light of a touch. And then you can add all the snow that you want on here. And think about where light's going to strike. This is another problem that we run into. Think about your light. If it's coming from here, where it's going to strike all the little protrusions that, that come up from the mountain. Just like so. The shadows are just like the highlights, only we're going in the opposite direction. And I think you've heard me say over and over in this show, each highlight must have its own private shadow. Each one. So if you want to make a peak stand out, give him his own private little highlight, or a shadow, I'm sorry. Okay, there we go. But probably the biggest problem, once again, is too much pressure. Use a very, very delicate touch. And the diffusing is another area we run into a lot of problems. And here, it's a light touch, a very, very light touch. It's so easy to destroy this. 
And especially if you're using a paint that's not super, super strong, firm, you're going to destroy all your work. So use a firm paint, barely touch the canvas. Just enough to diffuse this. And then we lift in the direction and the angle that the mountain is flowing. We lift it upward just to take out the little tap marks. And just let it blend right into nothing. And you can just make that big old mountain lay right around there in the mist. Okay, Steve, what's our next question? Would you show us up close how to make the trees and bushes? I'm also having trouble making the highlights stick to the canvas. <laughs> Another very common problem. Okay, let's make some. I'll show you several different ways here to make some trees. And uh, maybe we can get the camera to come in real close when we start this. And you can actually see how the brush is bending. I'm going to take a little blue and brown, a little touch of a lizard in here, a little sap green. We'll just mix all these together. Now, if we can bring the camera in very close, you can see how full of paint the brush is here. It has a lot of paint in there. Okay, let's make a, a nice big leafy tree. We go into the canvas and we just bend the bristles. And you see what's happening. Thousands and thousands of little leaves just happen. And we can make this tree any size we want it. Just, we just keep working and playing on it here and it just grows right off your brush. Okay, we'll put another little one right here while we got paint on the brush. Now, this is the way we make a leafy tree. And one of the ways to make bushes, for example, is to use a big brush, go straight into the canvas and bend upward. Just push upward. That's all there is to it. All we're doing is just bending the bristles. Make the bristles work for you. You're the master. Okay, let's look at there. Already we have a tree, mountains, and nice little bushes. Son of a gun. Okay, how to make an evergreen tree. We'll take, mix up some dark paint here. And we'll just use the same colors. Blue, brown, a little touch of a lizard, sap green. Very, very dark. <clears throat> and we'll take and fill a brush full of paint. Probably the biggest single problem we have is not putting enough paint into the brush. It takes a lot of paint to stick these bristles together. Okay, let's just go right up here on the canvas and let's make an evergreen tree. Let's just touch. All we're doing at first is just touching the canvas just to sort of give us a guideline. Then we take the corner of the brush and we start working from the center out. The center of the tree is normally always the thickest because you have limbs on the back of the tree, you have the trunk in the center, and the limbs on the front, all of which stop light and make the center of the tree look very, very thick. Okay, let me just finish this little tree up here. Another thing we work very hard to accomplish doing this, as tree limbs get older, they have a tendency to hang more. And underneath, the little needles and stuff begin, oh, they get tired. Some of them begin dying. And you always have these little things underneath. And for lack of a better word, I call them hangy downs. And there may be a proper name for them, but we just call them hangy downs. Okay, let's do that. Let's do that again, just so you can see one more time. And if we can get the camera in here real close, Let's do one right about here. We touch, get us a little guideline, and we start right with the corner. So the first time it's just a little touch. Next time, a little bigger. And we're just working outward, always from the center out. And nothing wrong with reloading your brush several times through there. So you have a lot of paint. And we're not drawing with a brush, we're just touching it and letting it come off. Okay, so that's, uh, I'll put some more little bushes right here. We also can use this one inch brush to make almighty trees. And all you're doing is the same thing we did with the big one. We just push. 
push, push, push. And you can use him sideways, just like you did the big brush to make all these nice little grassy areas come down through here. There we go. And let's go back to the big brush and just, just fill this up. Give you an idea here. Okay. The big brush covers a lot of space in a very short time. Use it to your advantage. Okay, I think the other part of the question was they were having trouble making their highlights stick on the trees. So, let's, let's put some highlights on these trees. First of all, I'm gonna take a little brown and white here and make some trunks. Might as well show the trunks too. All we're doing here is touching and pulling sort of to the left. And you can put as many of these little trunks in as you want. Here, just like so, and then just ever so often. And we can put little trunks growing everywhere. There they go. And over here, we'll do the same thing. Just touch. Indications. You don't see the whole trunk. Because we're going to have leaves in the front. Okay. Now, to put these highlights on, we're going to take and dip the brush into some magic white and then pull it through color. And maybe we'll make some nice green highlights. I'll put a little touch of phthalo green in here. And all you do is just push, just enough to bend the bristles. And just lay all those beautiful little leaves on there. Thousands and thousands of them. I used to spend weeks with my one-haired brush trying to do this. It almost made me angry the first time I saw Alexander on TV that he could do in a matter of minutes what took me days to do. Okay. Now, there's nothing wrong with going back into your magic white and adding a little more. So maybe we'll just put some highlights on here and let you really see how the highlights are made. And if you want to put some little smaller bushes down here, you're still using the same technique, pushing with a brush. Just wherever you want them. You can also use this brush sideways and make beautiful little highlights. Just let them sort of wander around wherever they want to go. You can spend a tremendous amount of time worrying about where things should be. In the period of time that you spend worrying about it, you could have completed an almighty painting. For the evergreen trees, I bring the brush back to a nice sharp point, just like I did to make the trees. And I start right up here at the top and just begin touching. Evergreen trees are normally darker than other trees anyway, so you don't want to kill all this beautiful dark color that you've got in here. You start at the top on any kind of tree and work down. By working down, your brush is automatically picking up the color that's underneath. Automatically gets darker as it goes down. Because in nature, the light would come through here. It would strike the top of the tree normally first. That will be the brightest area. Also, as limbs get older, they lose a lot of their chlorophyll. They begin losing a lot of their beautiful green color. So automatically this happens. You don't have to work at it. Let the brush work, let the paint work. We'll highlight this other little evergreen over here. Right here, okay. We just take them, just touch. And according to which side your light's coming from, you want that side of the tree to be just a little bit brighter than the other one. Okay, while I'm over here, I think I'll put some highlights on this other tree, give you one more to look at. Back to the basic problem. If it doesn't stick, majority of times your problem is your paint is too thick. So add a little more magic white with it. 
And we'll throw some little highlights on this one. Okay, let me wash out the brush. And we'll put just a couple more little highlights in here. We'll see what our next question is. There we go. Just let them fall in here. Wherever you want them. And another thing we do is mix the color on the brush. You've probably heard me say that throughout this series several times, but it's very important because that way you get a variety of color all on the same brush. Okay, I think that's enough playing. Steve, what's our next question? I love the reflections you do. Would you go over the process you use to make them? Hmm, that's one I should have had to ask a little earlier, but I don't think that's any problem. Let me clean out my big brush here, and we'll just see what we can do. This is also a good example of how you can change a picture right in the middle of the picture. So, Steve wants some reflections, so let's give him reflections. We'll just start right along in here and start pulling this downward. Just maybe like so. All we're doing is pulling the paint down. Okay, now, gently go across it, just enough to give it a watery effect. Don't destroy. <clears throat> okay. Now maybe you want to make a little more distinct reflection. So let's put a nice little bright yellow bush right here. And let's reflect that bush right into the water. And we can just reflect a lot of things while we got it on the brush here. Okay. Maybe we'll put a nice little bush out here that we can reflect. All I've done is turn the brush over, and I'm putting the bushes right into the water. Okay, now maybe we can get a close-up shot right in here, and let's see what we can do. We have the paint laid on the canvas, so now we're going to take, and very lightly, you almost let a hair touch. It's that light of a touch. Going to gently pull that down. You don't want to destroy, you just want to diffuse it. Now we're going to slight, with a light, light touch, just come across it to give it a watery effect. Okay, now we can do the same thing over here. Just like so. And you see what it looks like at this point. Don't worry about making it perfect with the first stroke. You have to pull down and then very gently come across. And it's very easy to destroy this. So all you want to do is just barely touch the canvas. Let a hair almost touch the canvas. Another thing that we get a lot of questions about is putting the water lines in. So we might as well put some in. Here I'm going to use just straight magic white. Put a little bit on the knife. And the one thing to remember here, if you're making still water, it's always flat, always level. So every little line that you put in it must be basically flat. You can go anywhere you want to go with it, but you have to keep them straight, okay? Good example here. Looks like this is traveling right on back. Okay, we'll put a little more magic white on our knife, and we're just cutting into the canvas. Look there and just let it go wherever you want it to go. Okay, now maybe over here on this side, we'll take a little bit of Van Dyke Brown, and we'll just show how you can make it look like soil, dirt, rocks, whatever. And we're just laying a little color on here. Straight Van Dyke Brown. Okay, then we'll take a little blue, white, and brown. And just like we were making mountains again, let it break. Let it break, leave these open spots. So it gives the appearance of dirt or stones or... OK, 
Okay, now we can put a little water line underneath here with the magic white. You're still keeping these lines basically straight. Okay. Okay. And yeah, we'll just add a few little sticks here and there. And maybe you want to show a little something happening here. You can just pull that down a little so it's not just a straight line going across. Okay. Just to break it up a little bit. And we'll put some little sticks here and there. And maybe we'll take just a touch more color and let it run down this dirt area here so it looks like it all comes together. You don't want to have a straight line right across there. So we'll just break it up here and there with some little grass that's growing down on the, on the bank right here. Okay. We could throw a few more little sticks here and there. Sometimes you can scratch through the paint, let the white show through and give yourself a very nice effect of little sticks, little trunks happening here in the bushes. Or sometimes you might want to take a little bit of paint and lay in there. Just like so. So there we go. And let some of these sticks run down on the on the bank too, on the soil area. It's not unusual, very common in fact, to have a lot of little twigs and sticks growing around the water. Just let these little things happen. It really produces a tremendous feeling of depth in a picture. Well, you know, we've sat here and, and answered questions, and son of a gun, if we hadn't finished a picture. And I think with that, I'm going to sort of bring this to a close. I hope we've answered the majority of your questions that really bother you. If you still have problems, or if there's anything you'd like to know about this method of painting, feel free to drop us a line. We'll be glad to, to answer any question that you have, as long as it's not too personal. We'll just about answer anything. And on behalf of my son, Steve, the entire crew here, I would like to thank you very, very much for being with us through this 13-part series. And hopefully we'll see you again in the near future. And with that, I'm going to sign this picture and tell each and every one of you, thank you from the bottom of my heart. We've enjoyed being with you. Happy painting.